Shalom. My name is Rabbi Yosef Hilton. On my left is Rabbi Norman Beaton. And on his left is Rabbi Jeremy Beaton. Shalom. Shalom. Welcome to Forever Israel. We are reading for Hebrew Bible Secrets. We start again the study of the book of Revelation. Now that we have the correct information, the revelation that Yahshua is Yahweh, God incarnate, and who came to reveal the book of Revelation to Yohanan, and we are going to read from chapter 1. First of all, I'd like to read the synopsis of this scroll, which says, Synopsis of the scroll of the Apocalypse, known as the scroll of Revelation, Gilean, Gilehayan, Kegalut. This is the scroll that was originally called the Apocalypse of Yohanan, John. The name was changed later to be called Revelation. The scroll of Revelation was complete before 70 CE and not the popular version of 95 CE, Common Era, because John was told to measure the temple in Revelation chapter 11, verse 1. How could he measure the temple since it had been destroyed during the Roman siege between 66 CE to 70 CE, the Common Era? Martin Luther, the German theologian, did not consider the scroll of the Apocalypse to be prophetic or apostolic. John Calvin did believe in it as part of the canon, but did not write a commentary on it. Gregory of Nazianzus, the Archbishop of Istanbul, Turkey, in the 4th century, did not want to include this in the Christian canon because he had difficulty in interpreting it. The Christians in Syria did not use this in their daily liturgical readings. Many Christians, even today, are afraid to read it. However, we fully believe this scroll has been coming to fulfillment in the last days, which are upon us. This is very much part of the inspired scrolls, not dictated by Rome, but by Yahweh, the Elohim of Israel, the Supreme God. In the scrolls is revealed the seven feasts of Israel <coughs> with the Yahubel Jubilee to the final victory and restoration for all of Israel. That means that all the Torah obeying Yahudim, Israelites, who strive to serve the set apart one, Yahweh, the Most High, of Israel, are already included in the restoration plan that is made for Israel and they are not excluded as wrongly taught and thought by many even to this day. The Messiah's blood covers them today but it is not yet time for them to know this. The Messiah is a type of Yosef in Egypt who fed his brothers with grain of Egypt but did not let them know about him until the very end. The only one door is Messiah. And when you understand that the Torah is the voice of Abba Yahweh, the Most High God, spoken through the Messiah, and Messiah is the one also giving the Torah, then you will have a revelation of this narrow door that Yahudim, the Yahudim, already have been trustworthily keeping the Torah and the Feast of Yahweh. Since the Torah is a feminine Hebrew word, the Torah that derived out of the mouth of Abba Yahweh, the Most High God, was handed to Mkokma, which is really represented, which is really represented by it, and in turn to her son, Yahshua, who then handed it down to the prophets of Israel. When the Messiah was questioned by two well-known persons, one an expert in Torah, in Luke 10, 25-27, and the other a rich man, in Matthew 19, 17. In both, the Messiah told them to guard and do the Torah commandments, to inherit eternal life. He did not say, wait for me to die and rise again. Yahuda is set as judge to guard over the Torah and feasts 
Yet many do not understand this plan, this plain truth. The revelation of knowing who the Messiah is not automatic or by flesh, but by the Ruach HaKodosh only, which is the Holy Spirit. For further understanding, we recommend two books, Islam, Peace or Beast, and World War III, Unmasking the End Times, Beast of Rabbi, the End Time Beasts, written by Rabbi Simon Atta from the following website, www.forever-israel.com. All glory to Melech Yahweh, the Most High God, our Maker for this present translation. Thank you, Rabbi. You're welcome. Um, so if we just look at the, if we just go back to um, when the Messiah was questioned by two well-known persons. The first one we have um, would be Luke 10, 25 and 27. So if we just look at that quickly. Uh, have you got Luke 25? I can get it. Okay. Thank you. Luke 10? Yeah. Luke 10, 25 to 27. I got that here. You got that? Can you yeah. read that please? Okay. Uh, Luke 25, um, sorry, 10, 25. And behold, a certain expert in the Torah stood up and tested him, saying, Rabbi, what shall we do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, what is written in the Torah? How do you understand it? And he answered, saying, You shall love Yahweh your power with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and you and your neighbour as yourself. Okay, thank you. And, um, are there any footnotes in there? No footnotes on that one. No right. footnotes, okay. And the second one we have is Matthew 19 and 17. 1917, sorry. Matthew 1917. And he said to him, Why ask me concerning the good? There is indeed one good if you want to enter into life, guard and do the commandments. Okay. And in this verse, you have three references okay, four, five, and six. Yeah, let's have a look at those. So, why ask me concerning the good? So the good is um, the translation of the King James Version here is incorrect. Yahushua, or Jesus, is pointing to Torah observance, which has the idiom, idiom for good used in Proverbs 4 and 2. So if anybody can get Proverbs 4 and 2, Rabbi, do you want me to do that? Would you like to apply? You can. Proverbs 4 and 2. So then if we go down to the next one, just as you're getting Proverbs 4 and 2, um, it says, there is indeed one good if you want to enter. Let's have a look at this word, enter. The longer readings found in most Bibles are missing in the important manuscripts. And let's have a look at the last one, which is um, life, guard and do the commandments. So that says, keep Torah, to have eternal life. Okay, so Proverbs 4 and verse 2 says, For I give you good teaching, forsake not my Torah. Right. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. So forsaking not the Torah and guarding and doing the Torah is what, you know, we, yeah, sure, Jesus is saying here. Yeah. So, you know, this is what we need to come back to the understanding. So with that said, we'll read. Chapter 1. Ready? Mm -hmm. Yep. <coughs> okay. The revelation of Yohanan, John, Ben Zabdi, or son of Zabdi, to the end times generation of Israel across the whole world. The election of Israel, chapter 1. Verse 1. The revelation of Yahashua, the Messiah, which Yahweh gave to him to show to his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signify, signified it by his Malachim, the angel, to his servant, Yohanan John. Verse 2. Who bear record of the word of Elohim and of the testimony of Yahshua the Messiah, and of all things that he saw. 3. 
Beneficial is he that reads and they that hear the words of this prophecy and guard those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. Your canon, John, to the seven congregations, not the seven churches, which are in Asia Minor, Turkey, favor be to you and shalom from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven Ruachot spirits which are before his throne, and from Yahushua the Messiah, who is the trustworthy witness, and the firstborn of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, to him that loved us and loosed us from our own sins in his blood, and has appointed us a kingdom serving as Kohen priest to Yahweh, the Most High God, and his Av, his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Verse 7. Behold, he comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth, shall wail because of him. Even so. Amen. 8. I am the Aleph and Tav, says the Master Yahweh, which is and which was and which is to come, the El Shaddai Almighty. I, Yochanan, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Yahashua, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of Elohim and for the testimony of Yahashua. 10. I was in the Ruach spirit of Yahweh's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a shofar, saying, What you see, write in a scroll and send it to the seven congregations which are in Asia Minor, Turkey, to Ephesus, and to Smyrna, and to Pergamon, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. 12. And I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden menorahs. 13. And in the midst of the seven menorahs, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girded about the chest with a golden band. 14. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were as a flame of fire. 15. And his feet like fine brass as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. 16. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shines in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying, to me, fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he, verse 18, I am he that lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of Sheol and of death. 19. <coughs> Write these things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. 20. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the Malachim, the angels of the seven congregations and the seven menorahs which you saw are the seven Yisraeli Kohalim. That's the end of the reading. Thank, thank you, Omar. Thank you very much. <coughs> okay, so as this is um, talking about the return of Yahushua, um, the author, Rabbi Simon Altaf, highly recommends for the people to visit the British Library to see the two chapters of Revelations discovered in Hebrew from the 17th century. The author at that time is unknown. You can <coughs> download from Google search as well. The manuscript has some marked differences from the King James Version. Okay, so that's the um, a note there from the writer of the scrolls here, Rabbi Simon. 
So let's go to the first footnote or the second footnote, which is um, <clears throat> Hosea. 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 Yeah. Six verse. So shortly, it says, shortly in Yahweh's sight are still thousands of years, as it's written, from a set apart perspective. <clears throat> Since we are at the threshold of the prophetic third day, according to the prophecy of Isaiah 6 and 2, therefore the third day has begun, and the prophecy spoken of must, of must now, or must now come to pass in the next few generations. So if we go to Isaiah um, 6 and 2. Okay. Hosea 6 and 2 says, After two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up, and, and we shall live in his sight. Okay, thank you, Rabbi. So the next footnote is, um, for the time is at hand. The verse for at hand itself is prophetic. The word in Hebrew, Yad, has a Yud and a Dalit. The Yud is for Yahweh and the Dalit for the door that leads to him. Yahushua, the Messiah, or Jesus, the Messiah, from John 10 and 9, which we'll go back to. Since this revelation is now being made known through the East or Eastern nations, where many of the scattered tribes live alongside the dispersion in Europe, the prophecies in Matthew 24, 27 indicate the Son of Man, or Yeshua, and his light will shine from the East into the West, Europe and other Western nations. So if we can quickly read um, the John, John 9. Yeah, yeah, 10 and 9. We Chapter have, 10, we, verse 9. Yes, please. I am the door, says Yahashua. By me, if any man enters in, he shall be rescued and shall go in and out and find pasture. And the other one, which is exactly. Matthew. Matthew 24, 27. Matthew 24, 27. For just as the lightning comes out of the east and flashes towards the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And in there you have two references, one and two. Okay. Would you like to read it? Yes, please. Okay. Reference one. This is prophetic about the east revealing the scriptures at the end of days. The true Hebraic roots scriptures would shine forth from the East. This means that Eastern nations will be side by side to bring Torah to the Westerns, to the Westerners who would be in deep apostasy. Is it any wonder that some manuscript evidence of the original Gospels was found in the Himalayan mountains and some Muslim nations in the East. At the end of the days, the Western nations will wane, but the Eastern ones will become more active in wanting to obey Torah. Two. It is very interesting that the light is transitive, meaning that the Western Isles will not get Torah obedience since the light flashes. This shows us that it flickers to the West. They get to know of the Torah, but do not fully get to obey his Torah. Right, thank you for that, Rabbi. You're welcome. So, yeah, so obviously the, it looks like <coughs> the Torah is going to take off in the East. Yes. So people are going to get the understanding, obviously, through... Um, I would imagine our Kohen and um, many of the other teachers who or people who would return back to Torah and would start obviously teaching as well and giving the instructions to the people in the, in the East. Okay. Um, and therefore, you know, the fact that it flashes in the West is just that people hear it over here and, and obviously in the Western nations, but they don't really want to deal with it. They don't yeah. really want to keep the commandments, if yeah. you know what I mean. You know, they hear, okay, we've got to return back to the commandments, but 
honestly, it's not for us. Yeah. So mm-hmm. there's going to be many, you know, who are just going to be dragging their feet. You know, yeah. you we, know. we were here, but we won't do. Yeah. As exactly. opposed to us, we were here, exactly. we will do. Yeah. Or just be rebellious. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. for the last two thousand plus years, <clears throat> they have been living with a with a statements that yeah. <clears throat> the law is not anymore. It's for the Jews, exactly. for the Israelites, exactly. not for us. Yeah, exactly. And they came up with their own. Yeah. They came up with so they came up with the religion of Christianity. Yeah. Without the Torah. Exactly. It's like trying to have a body without a heart. Exactly. Okay, so look, without, um, yeah, let's not... Digress too few, much. Yeah, we've got, we've got a few footnotes here to get through. So um, let's look at, um, okay, um, to the seven congregations. Okay, let's have a look at this. Uh, this number seven is indicative of Islamic nations rising up out of the east and spreading, surrounding every practical known congregation believing in Yahushua or Jesus. The seven congregations mentioned are a remez, a hint of the Islamic Empire encircling all the congregations mentioned in Turkey, which is now the case. Turkey is the place where the anti-Messiah is to arrive from. See the text, Islam, Peace or Beast by Rabbi Simon Altaf uh, at www forever israel hyphen israel.com um, we can know for sure that this now entails the assemblies as we know it will begin to be broken by the islamic beast which is happening already in the east and the west such as europe where muslims are rapidly building mosques um, on replacing empty churches as well as replacing empty churches mm. The first incident of this started with Jerusalem, where on the Temple Mount, the mosque, the abomination of desolation on the wing that was indicated by Daniel, the prophet, was erected, known as the Alaska Mosque. The next major occurrence happened with Istanbul, the stronghold of Rome, was conquered by Muslims, and then the church of Sophia became a a mosque. The pattern has also followed and will continue to follow all the way to the end. It is a time for survival and not the false revival the church is expecting, <coughs> but a real wake-up call for Christendom. So there, so here we see prophecies that were already spoken about in Daniel. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Taking place today. Yeah, exactly. So a lot of these churches are now being taken over by the Muslims and you know are becoming obviously yeah. surrounding the, the the churches as we know the christian churches yeah. as such yeah. so it's now for for the for the christians to to realize what's going on and to return back to the torah in order to have protection from Hashem, you know mm-hmm. and to be in the kingdom yeah. as well so this is this is a, a very important point here that these 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 um, radicals will start buying up all these places, all these old churches, and so on and so forth. Yeah. And some people may, a lot of people may falsely believe that. Well, you know, we're serving God, we're ser- we're in the church, we're believing Jesus Christ, our mm. Savior, and His blood. And why is all these things happening to a world? They do not understand the Torah teaches God does not like apostasy. Exactly. He doesn't. He hates idolatry. Exactly. We cannot say we love God and we're not keeping His commandments. We don't keep Shabbat. We don't exactly. keep Sabbath exactly. and the seven feasts. Exactly. So, anyone who is a Christian or Hindu, whatever the case may be, if you come to Israel, you are grafted in the tree. Israel is keeping the seven feasts every year. So everybody must follow that pattern. Exactly. Not not only Israel, they're in the in the Shariamin. They're keeping all the festivals. There you are. In so the that's heavens. yeah, in, in the heavens. heavens. So that's yeah. that's the pattern, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So the numerous it's mirrored image. Angels, angels. So below. Yeah, so the numerous yeah. angels are keeping yeah. the seven feasts annually. Of course. So must we. Exactly. So okay. that's why they are experiencing the attack. Exactly. Yeah, and it's it's already you know being foretold. It's so so let's let's move on before we digress. Yes. Um, okay. And so the ruach spirits, which are before his throne. So let's have a look at this word throne. The seven feminine spirits of Yahweh, apart from the ruach hakadash, the set apart spirit, the Holy Spirit, as we know it also. It may come as a shock to many of you, but Yahweh is our patriarchal father, just like the, our forefathers. There are ten attributes in Yahweh, but also ten aspects of him. He actually works in tens a lot. 
The menorah has seven upper candle lightings, places, so that so these represent the seven spirits, and also the menorah has three legs in its stand, which give us the Abba Yahweh, the Ruach Hakadash, which is the Mother, the Holy Spirit, and Yahushua, the Eternal Son. All in all, Yahweh is ten. This evidence is backed up by the Tanakh. See the Hidden Truths, Complete Hebraic Scrolls, Complete Bible. And we can also look at Zechariah 4 and 10 and Malachi uh, 2 and 15. These are things that either were concealed to earlier translators or they did not understand them fully to explain them. And many of these people went into a complete about turn of marriage and into an aesthetic lifestyle. Not commanded in scripture. This is patriarchy in Yahweh. What is evident about above in Shamayim in the heavens will only be allowed below on the earth. That is why this was allowed for our forefathers. So what we're seeing here is 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 God um, Yahweh basically with the seven spirits, which are feminine spirits. Yes. So in essence, they are his wives also, as well as the Ruach Hakadash, which is um, the mother, the eternal mother spirit. Mm -hmm. So she is the, the main wife, if you know what I mean. Yeah, she yeah. was the first one brought forth, as she says in Proverbs chapter 8. Right, so yeah. if, we, if we read quickly, Zechariah 4 and 7. 4 and 7, 4 and 10. Sorry, 4 and 10, sorry. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah Zechariah 4 and 10. Mm -hmm. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and see the plummet in the hands of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of Yahweh, which run to and fro, throughout the earth. to and fro, through the earth, the whole earth. Mm -hmm. So the eyes of Yahweh are the feminine spirits as well. So they, they also have a job to do as well as obviously you know, um, bringing in the um, the angels from above with with, mm -hmm. with the heavenly Father. But they are the feminine spirits, and they are his lesser wives, as opposed to the Ruach Hakadash, who is the main wife, mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit. Mother in Hokma, as we know her. Yes. Yeah. And they report to him what is taking place on the earth. Exactly. Can I just say something before we continue? So this yeah. is the hidden truth Hebraic scrolls, and you can see the menorah with the seven cups above for the lamps. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, if you look in the picture, you can see behind us. Behind us. Yeah. The menorah yeah. with the three legs, mm -hmm. which represents Yahweh, M Hokma. And, and Yahshua, the son. And us, we are the son too. And Israel, the son. Yeah. And also the, the angels who are the son as well. Yes, yeah. so yeah. all pray represent one son. Mm -hmm. And then the seven cups above are the seven feminine spirits, which also are the seven flames of fire burning before his throne of esteem mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Rabbi. So, Rabbi, could you please go to Malachi 2 and 15? Okay. Malachi 2 verse 15. And did not he, Yahweh, make them one, and the rest of the Rakamim spirits also his also? Why then, Akkad, one, that he might seek a godly seed? Therefore, take heed to your Ruach spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. Now we have three references in there, Rabbi. Okay. Five, six, seven, eight. Four references. Could you read them, please? Okay. Thank you. From five. The two were united as one. That is the meaning of one. Why not one? Six. From the Aramaic, this shows us the seven subordinate spirits of Yahweh which are also mentioned in Proverbs 9, verse 3. All seven spirits were trying to establish the righteous sons of Yahweh in the world. The father in Shamayim is also the original patriarch, and that is why we see his pattern in the world also, ending at the end of days in Isaiah 4, verse 1, which shows seven wives, to one man. Now, you have a reference there. 
Okay. Isaiah well, 4 verse 1. Yeah, Isaiah 4 verse 1 basically speaks about um, the end time days when the, the radicals obviously are going to be attacking Israel and the father obviously yeah. is, is going to go against uh, the, the radicals. war against the radicals. And yeah. A lot of them are going to die. So at this point, their wives are going to be obviously uh, husbandless. Mm -hmm. So then that's when he's talking about seven women will hold on to one man. Right, so these women obviously will be needing white with husbands, husbands, and they will obviously come to the understanding that um, um, the Torah is the way, and so they will holding on to these Hebrew men, these Torah abiding people, and obviously marrying obviously one man, but seven women will marry one man at the time. And this is also shown as a pattern uh, which was given to us by the Creator of the universe. So with the seven lights on the menorah you can see those are his seven wives. Mm -hmm. And then you have the other wife, the Ruach HaKadash, on one of the legs. So this makes up the family of Hashem, the wives of Hashem, yes. okay, of, of, the, of the Creator. So this pattern is, is in the heavens, so we are also able to replicate this pattern yes. on the earth as well. So this is what we've been shown here. We've been shown that the father has eight wives. If a man can afford eight wives on the earth, he can have eight wives on the earth. But he must be able to afford them. Yes. So, so this is what we're talking yeah, about. Yeah. Because it's harsh and the original principle. Exactly. I mean, you know, when, when, when Lilith, Adam's first wife, ran away from Adam, then Adam was given seven wives to compensate, so to speak. Yes. So that, you know, obviously you have to go back to Genesis to read, you know, about Lilith and, and, and Hashem giving um, Adam um, another seven wives. But he had to wait, you know, a few years for him to get those wives. But it happened. So if we understand that the beginning, Adam had seven wives mm -hmm. after Lilith, then we, you know, and now we're, we're going with the, with the Greek understanding of one and the Roman, one man, one wife. So how can we, as, 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 as Israel, build a nation with one wife? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, this gets into a whole other <coughs> topic, yeah. but we'll just leave it there for the moment. Yeah. So our original um, way of life was obviously a man could have more than one wife. Yeah. Yeah. Because a simple statement when he says go forth and multiply, mm. well, one wife cannot multiply sufficiently to create a nation. Exactly. All right. Exactly. So that's that's where we are. So, so thank the you. last footnote is yeah. eight. Okay, go on. No on. serial monogamy, Gentile divorce situation. Israel was always allowed plural marriage, so why divorce the wife then? Mm. Run, run after another. When one could, with the Kadosh covenant, marry another wife, and support the first, as did our forefathers, who ya, whom Yahweh loved. Yeah. That's it. So there you go. So, so if you have one wife, and then obviously, you know, you're going you're, you're gonna to seek another wife, um, you know, what's, you don't need to divorce that first wife. The first wife can still be with you. Mm -hmm. So you, in, rather than breaking up the family again, you know, and having the children without a father, you know, you keep the first wife, obviously, with the children, and then you, you take on the second wife. Mm -hmm. You know, and, 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 and then you become Akkad, you become one as a, still as a family unit. Yes, yeah. Are you with me? Rather yeah. than going through this, this whole divorce thing which, which the nations are doing now. Yeah. It's a continual, you know, families are breaking up, you know, you, you, know, we're, you know, we've been through it. So, yeah. we, you know, we know what, what it's about, you know. And, and the wives will be happy and their husband is still with them and the children see their father. Exactly. And life goes exactly. on. Exactly. So, you know, it's, it's, it's one big happy family. Yes. You know? So let's um, let's move on to the the next footnote here. Then, so we have um, um, verse five, and from Yahshua the Messiah, who is the trustworthy witness and the firstborn of the dead. So, this passage is connected back with Genesis forty nine and ten and Isaiah nine and six. So, um, see, please see the hidden truth of Beck's scrolls complete Bible. So, Rabbi, if we could get Genesis 49 and 10. Are you sure not 46 and 10? I've got 49 and 10. 49 and 10. Okay, 49 and 10. Yeah. Okay, Genesis 49 and 10 reads, uh, The scepter shall not depart from Yehudah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, to witness Shiloh. And he comes to receive homage from his people. Okay, any footnotes there? Uh, there's one, two, lawgiver. Okay. Uh, Judah is a lawgiver, mm -hmm. and when the Messiah comes, Judah will keep the scepter, but the people of the tribe of Judah will then be in submission to the Messiah. Since King David will be also be re resurrected, mm -hmm. sorry, 
then he shall either be the Messiah himself or in co-region. One candidate for the Messiah is Daniel the prophet or one in likeness of. Okay. Yeah, Daniel. Thank you for that. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Well, he was quite a man, wasn't he? Yeah. Exactly. So we have there, um, yeah, so Judah holds the scepter, basically. So Judah is the lawgiver. So those of us from Judah, as we are all from Judah, we've returned. Mm -hmm. Now we have the understanding of Torah. So therefore, now we lay down the law, basically, until Messiah comes. Yes. This is what we're talking about here. We're talking about Judah holds the scepter until Messiah comes. Yes. Then when Messiah comes, then Messiah will take the scepter and he will reign. Mm -hmm. But until then, that we have to lay, basically lay down the law. We're Judah. Yes. That's what we've been commanded to do. So because that, Judah and the Kohens have always been close together, haven't they? Exactly. So where do we get the understanding from? We got the understanding from the Kohen, yes. from the priests. So yes. Rabbi Simon yes. So therefore, now we've got this understanding. Now we can run with it. Right. Now the very same pattern when Yahshua was on earth, <coughs> he is from the from Judah. Mm -hmm. He was always with the Kohens, with Matthew. Luke, mm -hmm. they were Kohens, mm -hmm. although the ordinary Bible doesn't tell you that. Exactly. Yeah. They hid that, exactly. but we know now from the Torah that they were Kohens. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why they could write that's most the, of the, the New, New yeah, Testament. That's right. Yeah. that's right. So, you know, I know also understanding that every, every king, you know, every Messiah needs a Kohen, a yes. priest, yes. by his side, you know, mm -hmm. and a prophet. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you know, the, 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 the two are meant to be together, regardless. Yeah. But as we know, the Kohenins, they anoint the kings. Exactly. So they have so to go from God, the Kohenins, to the kings. Exactly. And you find, even when you see, when you look at historical things in England, uh, or some of their movies, they always had priests. Of course, they were not abiding in Torah, mm -hmm. but they still tried to emulate the, the principle. Yeah. There was always priests and bishops around the kings and queens. That's right, yeah. that's right. That's another story. So Rabbi, could you get um, Isaiah 9 and 6, please? Yes. Uh, okay. Isaiah 9 and 6 reads, um, For a child has been born to us, a son is given, and the government was established upon his shoulder. And he, the counselor of wonders, the mighty El, strong warrior, called him witness of the father, ruler of all shalom. Ruler of the shalom. Mm -hmm. Ruler of the shalom. Okay. So... There's quite a lot of footnotes here. Let's just see if we can tackle them one by one. The government was established upon his shoulder. So, Yahshua is Yahweh and will carry the government forever. Mm -hmm. So, understand that Yahshua, the Messiah, is Yahweh. Yes. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And he will carry the government forever. Okay, so, the second footnote. Counselor of Wonders. This is a more trustworthy meaning of the ancient Hebrew text. Well, the King James Version has it translated inaccurately. Yahushua indeed was a counsellor of many wonders. One such wonder was the stopping of stormy winds and high waves in the boat in Matthew 14 and 24. We'll get back to Matthew 14 and 24. In fact, let's, yeah, let's read it now. Matthew 14 and 24, if we could. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Matthew 14 and 24 mm -hmm. reads, But the boat was now a great distance from the land, tossed with waves, for the wind was against it. That's it. Thank you. Okay. So, if we move on to the next one, the mighty L. So the Hebrew word used here is Gibor as in the sense of a warrior or fighter in battle. Yahweh is a man of war type of action, as in Exodus 15 and 3. So we can just have a look at Exodus 15 and 3. Okay. Yeah. Um, Exodus 15 and 3 reads, Yahweh is a man of war. Yahweh is his name. And there's a footnote there which says, um, Yahweh's name is used twice to show his signature. So that's always a definite article when you always say something twice. Indeed. So it's to be recognised. Exactly. Okay, thank you for that, Rabbi. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, uh, Yahweh is a man of war type of action, as in Exodus 15 and 3, which we just read, taking us back to the Exodus of Egypt, where Yahweh fought against Egypt, and he will fight against radical Islam for Israel and rescue the whole of Israel in the future. 
The land of Israel will also be cleansed. Mighty El is just a title of a future warrior king. It's nothing to do with him being God. Okay, if we look at the next footnote, strong warrior. Okay, let's have a look at this. The chosen person of Abba Yahweh, of God, will carry the government forever. The only one who can match this is Yahushua, the future king and present king in heavens, who commands the hosts of Yahweh. This Hebrew word are two nouns joined together in the Isaiah Copper Scrolls while in the Masoretic text it is two separate words. So this can also mean mighty one of the warriors, applies to the Messiah when he comes to wage the final battle against the radical Muslims who turn up in Israel to try and annihilate Israel. Mm -hmm. So if we go to the next footnote which is called him, called him witness of the Father. Mm -hmm. So this word witness the king Hezekiah did enact laws that all the males would have to study the Torah during his reign, and he was a righteous king. So he did make a strong witness to the father's voice of the Torah. Mm -hmm. wow. So if you look at um, witness of the father, so the word father, this person not only this person is not the everlasting father, but a witness for the father. As the Hebrew word ad, A-D, is used in this and in the original ancient Hebrew. The meaning of this word is witness. It can mean until in a continual action. Mm -hmm. But this is not the meaning here. While Jewish um, commentators apply this wholly to Hezekiah, but it can also have a future application to the future Messiah the King of Israel. This applies to Yahushua, the Messiah only. Our only Ab, Abba in the Shemaim in the heavens, both spiritual and physical, is Yahweh. So therefore we await our future Messiah to come, to rescue us from the exile. Okay. okay. Excellent. So we have one last one, ruler of the Shalom. So the Dead Sea Scopper Scroll, uh, Copper Scroll sorry, of Isaiah have ha shalom, meaning that it identifies this word not in an airy fairy way, as many have put it, is a city and a place because it has the definite article of the in front of it. Mm -hmm. We know the place that this describes is the ancient city named for Jerusalem. So a future king who will be the ruler of Jerusalem, so it could ac um, accurately be translated using ancient Hebrew as ruler of the city of Shalom. Just as Shem was the king at one time, so will the future Messiah. This takes us back to the holy mountain of Sion, of Zion, and also ties this with Genesis 14, 18. This is where Melchizedek is called the king of Salem, or properly known Shalom. The same name here is, if one sees with his Hebrew spiritual eyes open, then the sod mystery is that it ties this text to Melchizedek, meaning King Messiah. Okay. Okay. So yeah, sure, Yahweh is going to be King, king and Messiah. King Messiah. 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 King Messiah. Yeah. So in, in the order of Melchizedek, so king, and priest. king and priest together, yeah. in a combination, a combined. Yeah. Yeah. So Melchizedek is the order of the king and the priest together. Yeah, yeah. yeah. priest the king. Where the, yeah, where the priest, the priesthood, as we know, is from the line of Aaron. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, but this is a different priesthood. In this, in the order of Melchizedek, so king and priest combined together. Mm -hmm. yeah? yeah, okay. So with that, we'd like to say uh, thank you for watching, and we hope that this has brought some new understanding um, and some new um, revelation in regards to uh, the New Testament and the book of Revelation. And um, we hope uh, we will see you on the other side. Thank you for watching. And shalom, shalom. shalom.